Okay, where have we up to? Chapter 9 The Triumph of Forgiveness Almost immediately after dissolving the Hudabiyah agreement, the Quraysh began to have doubts. They sent Abu Sufyan, the most prominent leader of Mecca, to speak to Muhammad and attempt to renew the treaty. He was refused an audience. He asked Abu Bakr, Muhammad's closest companion, to intercede on his behalf. Abu Bakr refused. Abu Sufyan then went to Ali and Fatima, the Prophet's son-in-law and daughter. But again, he was refused. Then finally Abu Sufyan went to the mosque in Medina and proclaimed that Meccans were willing to make peace. Oops. He then returned to Mecca. I dropped my bag. As the Muslims prepared for mobilization, they thought they were on their way to Syria to conclude the unfinished business of the Battle of Muta. Some, however, knew or guessed what was about to happen. A prominent Muslim, Hatib bin Abi Balta, who had fought at the Battle of Badr, sent a secret message to Mecca warning them of an impending invasion. Hatib was concerned about the fate of his own family and children, as well as his clan, who were with the Quraysh in Mecca. The letter was intercepted, but Hatib's treason, treason was forgiven. Muhammad's preparation was so well organised, and his advance towards Mecca was so rapid that the Quraysh were taken by surprise. They learnt of the Muslim advance only when it was less than half a day's journey from Mecca. The Muslim army reached Mecca in January of 630 of the Common Era. It was 10,000 strong and well equipped. It consisted of many tribes, each with its own leader and its own camp. Muhammad asked them to spread out and make huge bonfires in front of their camps. A few Meccans, including Abu Sufyan, made a clandestine foray to estimate the size of the Muslim army. They were astonished to see how far the Muslim forces had, were spread. But their presence was detected and they were caught. By this time, Abu Sufyan was granted an audience with Muhammad. There's a lot of spelling mistakes in this book. It needs to be checked. When Abu Sufyan was brought to Muhammad, he found himself in front of a court consisting of the elders of the Muhajirun, the migra migrants, and the Ansar, the native helpers of Medina. There was heated discussions and many wished to see Abu Sufyan executed. But after a dialogue between Muhammad and Abu Sufyan, the long-term redoubtable opponents converted to Islam. As a leader of the Quraysh and a proud man, he expected some privileges, which were granted, of course. Muhammad announced that whoever entered the house of Abu Sufyan would be safe and who remained in their house and locked their doors would be safe and those who congregated around the Kaaba would be safe. Scholars disagreed whether Abu Sufyan came to Muhammad by accident or whether this was pre-arranged meeting. There is still little doubt that Abu Sufyan had genuinely converted to Islam. The following morning the Muslim armies entered Mecca unopposed. The army was divided into four divisions and the strict orders not to fight or shed any blood. Abu Sufyan ran through the streets of Mecca calling on his people to offer no resistance. But a handful of Meccans belonging to Banu Bakr clan who had violated the Hudabiyah agreement still resisted. And there was a skirmish involving Khalid ibn Walid battalions but calm was soon restored. Muhammad now went to the Kaaba and performed the Tawaf, where they go around the Kaaba seven times. A ritual that symbolizes the unity of believers and the worship of one God. The Meccans gathered around the Prophet and he delivered this address. There is no God but God. He has no associates. 
He has made good his promise and helped his servant. He has put a fight and allied armies during the Battle of the Trench. Every claim of privilege, inherited authority or blood on account of tribal feud or property are all abolished by me. Goresh, God has taken you from the arrogance and haughtiness of paganism and the venerations of ancestors. Man springs from Adam and Adam sprang from dust. And then he read the following verse from the Quran. O people, we created you out of a man and a woman and made you into races and tribes so that you should recognize one another and not despise each other, it says in brackets here. In God's eyes, the most honored among you are the ones who are most mindful of God. Chapter 49, verse 13. It's actually one of my favorite verses. After he finished his address, Muhammad looked at the Quraysh. There in the gathering were those who persecuted him, tortured him, humiliated him, killed some of his followers, conspired to murder him, drove him out of the city of his birth, incited the tribes of Arabia to rise up against him and wage relentless wars to destroy him and his people. O people of Quraysh, he asked, what do you think I'm going to do to you? And they replied in together, Good, you are a noble brother, son of a noble brother. And Muhammad replied, There's no blame on you to this day. You're free to go your way. And then he entered the Kaaba. Its walls were painted with pictures. He looked around at the pictures and images and he asked them to be removed. It also contained a number of idols, the Hubal, the chief deity, carved in precious stones at the centre. The Prophet touched all of them, one by one, with a stick and recited the verse, Say, the truth has come and falsehood has passed away. Falsehood is bound to pass away. Chapter 17, verse 81. The idols were then torn down and smashed. Mecca was declared a sacred and holy city. Muhammad ordered that it was forbidden to shed blood in the city or to destroy any trees and around Mecca, in and around Mecca. All killing must stop, he announced. It's a heinous crime. The general amnesty, a profound act of forgiveness, had a deep, resonating impact in the inhabitants of Mecca. They queued up to be converted and the whole city embraced Islam. The Hunayn encounter. The conquest of Mecca did not end the hostilities of the pagan tribes of Arabia. In particular, the tribes of Hawazin and Thaqif, which had been strong supporters of the Quraysh, were bitterly opposed to Muhammad. The Hawazin, a powerful, violent tribe, lived between Mecca and Taif. The Thaqif were the ruling tribes of Taif when Muhammad was stoned and thrown out when he went to preach while he was still based in Mecca. I didn't cover that in this book that much. That's my favourite part. But that's me speaking, not this book, okay, by the way. When Muhammad was stoned and thrown out and he went to preach while he was still based in Mecca, Taif was also the site of the Temple of Alat one of the chief deities of the pagans. Had Muhammad not taken Mecca by surprise, the Hawazin and Thaqif would have joined the Quraysh to defend it. As Muhammad was converting the inhabitants of Mecca, the Hawazin and Thaqif were getting ready to make their war against him. They managed to bring together tribes to form a joint front to oppose Muhammad. They mobilized all the members, including the women and children, and carried their possessions into the battlefield. Crazies. They planned their campaign very carefully before marching to the valley of Hunayn, the, su the southern eastern part of Mecca. 
The plan was simple. As the Muslims marched through the valley, they would be attacked in the dark with arrows. And when the Muslims retreated in disarray, the pagan tribes would fall upon them as one man and reduce the Muslim ranks into rabble. The Muslims would be defeated decisively and the victory over Mecca would become irrelevant. It was a plan that Muhammad himself had used in the Battle of Uhud. And it almost worked. And there's a subsection here. Ansar concerns, the helpers of the Medina concern. The Ansar, Muhammad's long-time supporters who had accompanied him from Medina, were concerned that the Prophet would resettle in Mecca. On hearing these fears, Muhammad reassured them that he would live and die in Medina. He stayed in Mecca for only two weeks before returning to Medina. Is this recording? Yeah, it is recording. Hang on. Sorry. Muhammad heard of the preparations of the Hawazin and Thaqif towards the end of the short stay in Mecca. He set out to meet them with a force of 12,000 soldiers, 10,000 of whom had come with him from Medina and 2,000 of whom were the new converts from Mecca, including Abu Sufyan. His army passed the Valley of Hunayn while it was still dark, and as planned it was greeted with the shower of ar arrows. Unable to see the enemy, the Muslim army retreated. A general charge followed. Tribesmen of the Hawazin and Thaqif poured down from the sides of the canyons into vast numbers with their long spears. Panic-stricken, the Muslim began to run in all directions. But Muhammad stood his ground. He was surrounded by some of the close and compa closest companions. A call went out to Muslims to regroup. By now, the whole of the pagan camp had descended from their vantage point on the hills and were face to face with Muhammad's army. The sun had appeared over the horizon. Rally forth to battle, chanted the Muslims as they quickly reorganised their ranks. Muhammad watched as men began to fall on both sides. And very soon the Hawazin, Thaqif and their allies realised that victory was not possible and began to flee. They left their women, children, camels, sheep, silver behind. Around 6,000 were captured, but Muhammad did not let his enemy rest. He moved to Taif and laid siege to the city. It was unsuccessful and then after a month he returned to Medina. By now, Muhammad was 60 years of age and was a powerful leader of a rapidly growing community. Islam was a dominant and powerful force on, in Arabia. Emissaries began to arrive from all over Arabia, offering peace and in some cases, expressing the desire to enter the religion of God. Conversion was not a matter of accepting that there is only one God and Muhammad is his messenger. No, it was also require, required the payments of zakah, the compulsory religious tax, that is the due and the right of the poor, as well as sadaqah, the voluntary charity. Those who did not embrace Islam became clients of the Muslim state. The people of Taif were among the first to send their emissaries and willingly converted to Islam. The delegation of Banu Tamim, a tribe from eastern Arabia, arrived in Medina and challenged Muhammad to a poetic duel. The poets spoke of their noble character and exalted status. The reply came from two of Muhammad's companions who spoke of the nobility of the people who have God's apostle with them. After the competition, the Banu Tamim declared their faith in Islam. The delegation from Najran, a Christian town between Mecca and Yemen, consisted largely of priests. They were allowed to worship in the Prophet's mosque. They questioned Muhammad about Jesus, but they were not satisfied with his answer. Muhammad asked them to join him in prayer, reciting verses of the Quran. Come, let's gather our sons and your sons, our women and your women, ourselves and yourselves, and let us pray earnestly and invoke God's rejection of those who are lying. Chapter 3, verse 61 They refused. Then Muhammad asked them to join him in monotheistic worship. 
fellowship, sorry, reciting the verse. Say, people of the book, let us arrive to a statement that is common to us all. We worship God alone. We ascribe no partner to him. And none of us take others besides God as Lord. Chapter 3, verse 64. To that they agreed, but then changed their minds and returned to Najran. Delegation followed after delegation, and virtually all of the year, beginning from April of 630 of the Common Era, was spent receiving emissaries. Hence, this tenth year after the migration to Medina is known in Muslim tradition as the year of deputations. The Farewell Sermon By this time virtually all the pagan tribes of Arabia had become Muslims and those still remained Christians and Jews came under Muhammad's protection. Muhammad himself was physically and mentally exhausted. The battles, the constant concerns for his followers, family tragedies as well as constant prayer and fasting finally took its toll. His mission to unite Arabia under the banner of Islam was almost complete. In just over two decades, he had transformed the feuding and undisciplined Arabs into an organised and disciplined society. He provided them with a vision of a just society, even though he himself could not read or write. I mean, well, come on, man. He just said earlier that he was probably the most educated there and it was a custom not to read or write. <sighs> Memorization. He had infused a strong love of knowledge and learning among his followers. In short, he had laid the foundation for a vibrant culture and civilization. Only one longing remained to perform the Hajj, the full version of the pilgrimage to Mecca. Muhammad's Prayer. That's a subsection, by the way. Muhammad's Prayer. Lord, let me live among the poor. Let me die among the poor. And on the day of resurrection, raise me among the poor. During February of 632 of the Common Era, Muhammad was finally able to fulfill his ardent, most deepest desire. Ten years after he had been forced to migrate from his native city, he held a convoy said to be between 90,000 to 120,000 pilgrims. From Medina to Mecca, it came to be known as his farewell pilgrimage. Towards the end of the pilgrimage, he delivered a sermon in Arafat, one of the ritual sites of the Hajj. A short distance from Mecca, sitting on his camel, he spoke to a vast crowd, his words taken up by individual places at key positions and relayed to the assembly. In the farewell sermon, Muhammad reminds Muslims of the five daily prayers in their faith, belief in one God and his messenger, prayer, fasting, charity and the pilgrimage to Mecca, and gave a full account of how the Hajj is to be performed. He then summarised his life's teaching in these words. O people, lend me your ears, for I know not whether after this year I'll be among you. I'm going to paraphrase this and put it here. O people, give me attention, and I don't know if after this year I shall be among you. Regarding the life and property of every Muslim as a sacred trust, return the goods entrusted to you to the rightful owner. Don't hurt anyone so that no one may hurt you. Don't take you usury. It's forbidden for you. And help the poor. Clothe them as you would clothe yourself. It's true that you have certain rights with regards to your wives. But they also have rights over you. Treat them well and be kind to them. They're your partners. They're your helpers. Know that every Muslim is a, bro a Muslim's brother and that Muslims are brethren to one another. It is only lawful to take from a brother what he gives you willingly. Don't be unjust to your own selves. No one is higher than others unless he is higher in virtue. Reason well and ponder my words 
which I convey to you right now. And when he had finished his sermon, he asked, God, have I conveyed my message? And the crowd replied together, Yes. That's quite profound, that. Let me say that again. When he finished his sermon, Muhammad asked God, Have I conveyed my message? And then the crowd responded, Yes. The following verse was then revealed. Today I have perfected your religion for you, completed my blessing upon you, and chosen as your religion Islam. Chapter 5, verse 3. Muhammad did not live long after this sermon. He became ill, suffering from fever and headaches. He couldn't sleep at night and he died on June 632 of the Common Era. He was 63 years of age. He was surrounded by his family and companions and he was asked to be buried in a room in the house of his wife Aisha. Within the next 50 years, Muhammad's followers held sway from Persia to Egypt. He had a strong presence in the Mediterranean and were on their way to Spain. And within a century, Islam had become a global religion and a flourishing civilization.